Welcome to Between the Before and After, a podcast about the stories that shape us. I'm your host, Coach John McLernan, and each episode I bring you an inspiring guest with a moving story that shines a light on the power of the human spirit. Before we dive in, I want to let you know about two very important things. Number one, the stories shared here are often gritty, raw, and vulnerable, and very likely will include speaking about sensitive topics suited for a mature audience. Number two, this podcast is also broadcast live on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So on whatever platform you follow myself or Freedom Nutrition Coaching, you have the opportunity to participate in this discussion during the live stream. And we encourage your participation both by commenting and asking questions. And so this podcast is about exploring the stories that take place between the before and after photos, not just in the realm of weight loss, but in all areas of life. So let's dive in. All right, I'm excited today to chat with a fellow Canadian from the west coast of Canada, coming at us from Vancouver. How are you doing, Sam? Hey, doing well, John. I appreciate the opportunity of being able to share, and uh, it's great to have another fellow Canadian. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think you're you're quite a prolific storyteller, if I understand correctly. Don't set the expectations too high. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just before we dive into into your story, and because there's a really cool personal journey here, really your journey of like discovering yourself, your roots, your heritage, and really what that brought up in yourself in terms of personal development. But uh, if people were to uh, find you, where would they uh, where would they locate you? Yeah, you'll be able to find me on LinkedIn and yep. Twitter and Instagram. And also, I've got about 190 blog posts that are located okay. on my website. Yeah, 190 of insights and things that have really helped me, but it's also helped others. And that's just www.sam-thiara.com. Yeah. And Thiara is T-H-I-A-R-A. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, you're also, uh, are, do I have this right? Are you a professor at uh, university as well? Yeah, so I'm a I'm a limit I'm a lecturer at uh, Simon Fraser University at the BD School of Business, and I teach uh, organizational behavior and uh, the concepts of things like leadership and ethics and uh, those really great subjects that uh, I think uh, help us as a society. Yeah, so which is really interesting because I'm I'm fascinated by behavioral psychology. When we're talking about organizational behavior, are we looking at like a corporate structure, or are we looking at the behavior of individuals within an organization? Actually, it even stems beyond that. Like I go outside of that. Uh, oftentimes when I'm teaching this, so it is about how do we create an aligned functioning organization, but it's also about the individual. And oftentimes when I'm teaching my class, it's about personal development. For example, one of the key takeaways in the entire semester is I want students to realize who they are, mm. not what do they want to do. Because I right. think it's it's one of those things if I think it's people just naturally fall into that stream of what they want to do. But asking them, who are you, I think is a really important question because it really helps them navigate then once they realize who they are. And I think that can be a really uncomfortable question to ask. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of us get stuck into what I want to do because we, we don't necessarily want to dive into our own deeper sense of identity. It can be a little bit unnerving or uncomfortable. And I think that's actually a great segue into mm -hmm. your, your own story. So um, because you went on this journey to kind of really discover more about yourself and your identity. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, were you born and raised in, in around Vancouver area? Actually born in uh, England. Okay. Raised, yeah, but raised in Vancouver. But my parents come from Fiji Islands, which is near Australia, and my grandfathers yeah. are from India. So it's quite the hodgepodge of cultural <laughs> identities. No um, kidding. And John, I guess you can throw in as well, for 11 years, I played in an Irish military pipe band. So there's a bit of Irish to there as well. <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, Fiji is a really interesting country because there yeah. seems to be, um, for those who might not know, I actually interviewed a Fijian and told her story mm -hmm. of coming to Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, you can imagine growing up in this beautiful, lush, tropical paradise and then coming to Canada in, in Alberta in December <laughs> <laughs> when it was minus 40 when you've never seen snow or anything like that in your life so but fiji yeah. has a really uh, like quite a, a population that's almost divided i don't know if it's right down the middle but uh, between those of, of indian heritage and those of sort of native pacific islander heritage and it's kind of curious how it, it ended up with that kind of split or divide and wonder yeah. if it's connected to like british colonial rule yeah it, it is british colonial rule because what happened is in fiji uh when it was colonized the uh, British wanted the indigenous 
native Fijians to, you know, do the sugarcane farming, but they found that it just never really worked well. So then they looked to India and uh, a particular part, which is uh, UP and Upper Pradesh, uh, Bihar region, where they do grow sugarcane, and uh, they brought in indentured laborers from Hindu and Muslim to, to do the sugarcane farming. And slowly right. the population increased and, uh, you know, uh, more and more people arrived. Uh, before you know it, then the population did have about a, you know, 50-50 split. And then unfortunately there was uh, a coup that happened about a couple of times and uh, the coup was bloodless, but equally it made people realize that the Indians were the economic base. The native Fijians were more the um, military and the police. So, there was that sort of struggle of of identity, but equally at the same time uh, of homeland. And as a result, many Fijians, uh, Indo-Fijians, as we would say, uh, mm -hmm. wound up moving to different parts of the world as well because of, you know, they were travelers as well. Right. So they maybe didn't feel quite as at, at home. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think actually in the region of India where they would have come from that you were describing, uh, is it like kind of the northeast region of India? Do I have that right? It's, it's probably more the central part of India that okay. uh, these people had emerged from. Yeah. yeah. Sort of northern but central area as well. Yeah. And so they, they came in and you said they were indentured, like we're talking indentured servitude. Is this like uh, paid it, uh, laborers? Uh... It's, it's a softer, I guess, rule of slavery, but a softer right. rule. They were given a ticket. Uh, they were put onto boats. They came to Fiji. Uh, if they wanted to, they could go back. Some did, but many stayed. Um, but uh, oftentimes, many of those who went through this, they wound up uh, looking at it as almost um, a soft form of slavery. But life mm. in Fiji was was better than maybe what they had in India. But what was also interesting is there's that's the Hindu and Muslim population. And from India, there were two types of uh, Indians that came to India, uh, sorry, to Fiji on their own, the Gujaratis and the Sikhs. The Gujaratis mm -hmm. were entrepreneurial uh, people that looked at it as an opportunity to grow businesses. And that's where they came, not as indentured laborers, but they came as, uh, you know, people that wanted to build onto the economy. And mm -hmm. the Sikhs came as ex-military, ex-police, uh, administrators. Um, so they came on their own as well. And again, they were farmers, so they were also, uh, but not as indentured laborers, but they came in as farmers and uh, thrived in that environment. So people did thrive and uh, they worked hard, but they thrived as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, to me, to me, of course, this is really interesting. Um, are you aware, I'm not sure how connected you are to sort of Fiji, but is there still like um, a bit of a, I don't know if it's like a power struggle between the, the, the ethnic mm -hmm. groups or, or is there a greater homogeneity or... Uh, I would say that there's a better, it's now better. And part of it is because the realization that if, if we do have the Indians leaving the economic system, there's going to be this vacuum. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, I, and I do believe that uh, Fijians do see it, even those who have moved on uh, to other parts of the world still see their roots as being in Fiji as well. In fact, um, I would say the generations you know, of like my parents and the generation that we have now, mm. and even the ones that are coming in, uh, have more closer ties to Fiji than they would India. Okay. Yeah. So somewhere in this, um, you had this idea that I need to go and explore my, explore my roots or my ancestry, my heritage, kind of figure out how, how I came to be and to, to be who I am. Uh, how old were you when you started um, having kind of these, these sorts of questions? I, I would say that, you know, think of it this way. I mean, growing up in Vancouver, I, I moved here when I was four. You yeah. know, you start assuming yourself to be, well, you're Canadian. I mean, you yeah. know, as you know, we play hockey, we uh, yeah. eat hot dogs, and uh, when we scrape our knees, we bleed maple syrup. I mean, you grow yeah, yeah. up being Canadian. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I think it was when I got to high school, um, you know, you you started to suddenly realize that, you were actually a visible minority. I mean, prior to it, it never even factored in. Mm -hmm, but then, mm -hmm. you know, at grade eight, you get suddenly beat up because you're a different color. You suddenly yeah. are like, wait, what's going on here? I mean, I'm Canadian. And uh, 
the person right. just said, nope, I don't like Indians. And uh, it, but they never even really they were quite ignorant. They didn't even know anything about what it meant to be Canadian or Indian. Right. Yeah. But but, John, I think the, the part that really resonated for me was when I went to university, because growing up in Vancouver and in my school, you know, out of a population of, let's say, 500, 600 students, there literally was just a small handful of visible minorities. Yeah. But but wait, what I, year was this? This was in the 1980s. And okay. Then, yeah. Yeah. And then when I got to university, that's when I actually encountered a much more international and diverse group. And, you know, now you're meeting with people who actually have come from India, Pakistan, and uh, from all parts of the world. And they're sharing their culture and identity, their food and everything. And you're like, wait, what am I missing here? And yeah. I think that's where it actually started with this idea of, you know, realizing that there was this side of my identity that was missing. Mm -hmm. And you touched on something that I just wanted to explore just briefly, just like as, as a teenager, kind of getting bullied for um, your, your skin color. Because I, I grew up in, well, in Mission originally, which mm -hmm. is just outside of Vancouver. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had friends, Ravi and Manny growing up and they, they were of Indian heritage. And we went over to their house for like blueberry pancakes, like their mom made yeah. really great, you know, and we never really thought anything of it, I guess. Um, and then we think about in Surrey, another region in the lower mainland yeah. near Vancouver, there's quite a significant Surrey and Delta because the, the um, especially from the Punjabi region, there's a lot of farmers who come over and, and do really great, like berry farming over here. Um, but it's, it's, amazing to kind of think about you know someone just saying i don't like you because of the color of your skin yeah. you know when you, you probably like you don't i don't imagine you spoke with a trace of an accent or anything like that no. like no no you know and and it, it's the way i also describe it is it's like um you know you grow up in vancouver but it's like a duck's egg rolls into a swan's nest and it hatches and when it hatches you suddenly you know you're a swan too even though you're a duck but you never really pay attention to it until somewhere along the way, maybe you're out on the water with the other swans and yourself and you suddenly see a reflection. You're like, wait, OK. And then you look at the swans and you look at yourself in the reflection going like, wait, OK, I'm maybe not quite that. And it was interesting growing up. And I write about that in the book that I wrote about uh, my journey to India is, uh, is the fact that I I've, growing up, I pushed my Indian identity to the back. I, I wanted to be Canadian and you saw yourself as Canadian, but it's later on in life, you suddenly started experiencing, wait, there's something that's missing that I think I need mm. to rediscover and really embrace and appreciate. So, yeah. And then, so did you decide mm -hmm. to travel to Fiji first and then to mm -hmm. India or how, how did this journey go for you? I think it wasn't so much, uh, planned out that way but uh Fair enough, my yeah. Parents, yeah my parents just said look you know uh you and your brother have never been to fiji you guys should go and uh, explore yeah. fiji and uh, uh we went there and and john it was interesting because all of a sudden it's like you know you're in canada and there's quite the caucasian population here at that mm -hmm. time especially and then you get to to fiji and all of a sudden you're walking around the streets going like okay wait this these people are just like me and uh, yeah, yeah. you're suddenly in this environment going like, okay, wait. And then you start uh, uh, embracing more and more of the food and listening to the yeah, music. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my, my cousins dragged me out to a Bollywood film for the first time. And I was, <laughs> couldn't understand a word. And you're just trying to visualize what they're saying in the pictures and things like that. But then right. you started embracing that. Yeah. And, and did you um, grow up speaking other than English? Mm -hmm. Did your parents um, speak another language and teach you that language? Well, I mean, growing up, it was more of English was predominantly in our family here in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the fact that my parents said, OK, you got to be Canadian and that means you've got to be this. It just was they got busy with work and, um, yeah, you know, they would use the language to some extent, but we never really spoke it. But when I was probably around 13 or 14, my grandmother moved from Fiji to Canada. She didn't speak English. I didn't speak Hindi. So we started conversing. And then as the more and more I conversed, uh, now I'm fluent in uh, like the Fiji dialect of Hindi, but okay. uh, I'm quite fluent in it, but I still get laughed at because of the sequencing that I put the words in. Right. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because so trying to learn a language, you know, that's mm -hmm. in, in a sense, I don't want to say it's necessarily your mother tongue, but it's, it's a part of your yeah. lineage, but they yeah. use like an entirely different alphabet, entirely different. Like it's just to, to wrap your brain around as an adult can be a real challenge. Yeah. Um, and then, and then there's like maybe the, the subtle accent hints and things like that, that we wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. necessarily think about. Um, and so if you start speaking it, even though you're fluent in it, is, would it be evident to a native speaker of Fiji mm -hmm. and Hindi that you are, you have someone who's learned this as a second language? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's the way I talk. It's the, the sequencing. I mean, in, in English, you would say I'm going to the store, but in Hindi, you would say to the store, I am going, it's almost like the French version of, right, of yeah. it. And then there's even terms I use that don't exist. I remember uh, saying something and people just laughed at me and I was like, what? And they were like, cause I said, you know, whatever it is, I said, oh, it's, it's sitting up there, but I used a direct translation in Hindi and people said, in Hindi, we don't say it's like there's nothing about sitting there. Like um, sitting means what we do with our butts on a chair, but right. there isn't anything that sits there. And um, those are things that, you know, that's why people would always say, okay, say this, talk to me. I, I to hear. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Because yeah. they wanted to hear how you would express it. And so, uh, mm -hmm. but that, what an interesting experience just in that as well, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think it gives a lot greater empathy when we encounter someone who's come to Canada and learning English as a second language and they're trying to they're right. they're trying to speak it when we ourselves try to learn a second language or go somewhere and and we fumble our words and it just feels <laughs> awkward and uncomfortable. And you know, yeah. there's something about it I think that people should should experience so that when you encounter someone who's trying to speak English as a second language, we're a lot more patient with them. We go, Oh, like I now understand the struggle of this and the courage and it takes to be willing to be vulnerable and make a lot of mistakes along the way. No, and John, to that point, I mean, when I teach at uh, SFU, the university, there's also an international college right at SFU. And mm -hmm. so these are all international students. And uh, yeah, it's not uncommon for these students to be reserved and um, almost held back because they're, they say, well, what's this person going to say or think? And I, mm -hmm. my response back to them is, I'm sorry, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but you're no one's priority. I mean, if you were to say something wrong in the store lineup, do you think that person's going to go home and tell people at home? And I said, I'm sorry, we're not that important. So just don't be <laughs> yeah. afraid. Don't be afraid to share and to to express. The more you try, the better you're going to be at it. Yeah, and actually, I love I love the way of phrasing that that, that you know, no one's priority, and it's 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 like you know you're unique, but uh, just like the other eight billion people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, uh, and and it's it's always funny because I even put it up on my lecture slides. I say, how many of you have fallen down in public? And I put my hand up, and all these students put their hands up, and I said, how many of you ran into a post, and all these hands go up, and mine goes up? How many of you have waved at somebody, and you suddenly realize? they weren't waving at you and you're just sort of waving and you put your hand down because you're embarrassed <laughs> yeah. and all these hands go up. And I said, so I've done all of those, but do you think they go home and say, Oh my gosh, you're not going to believe someone was waving at me today. Um, and that I didn't even know who they were. I'm sorry. We're not anyone's priority. <laughs> uh, and it's, it can be embarrassing if you fall down in public, but you get back up and then, you know, you carry on with your day. Same thing goes with speaking and, uh, Mm -hmm. gaining that confidence and you know what john i love it where i get them in the first year i keep in touch with them and then see them at graduation and their level of confidence has elevated uh because of the fact that they have that strength and they they always come back and they always come and find me and talk to me that's amazing so mm -hmm. when you when you got on a plane to uh to go to fiji and mm -hmm. so you obviously had family over there that, that yes. could kind of meet, meet you on that side mm -hmm. um what, what was kind of your first impression arriving there Oh man, it is paradise. Like I got there at three in the morning. Um, they open the door to the plane and you get hit with this, the humidity <laughs> at three in the morning, but the smell of sugar cane. Yeah. yeah. It, it was, it was amazing. And then, you know, you're, you're feeling the um, environment, the heat and everything. And, you know, it's Canada is, you know, well-established, well-developed and Fiji is a, is a great country that has, it, it certainly has its development as well. Uh, but then you're like, oh, there's only actually back then when I went the first time, they had television, but no channels. And then like uh, you could watch videos. Right. And then eventually it was one channel. Um, so, you know, but then you're OK, because we're going out there to the beach. We're going out with our cousins to play tennis, etc. 
So right. it didn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Who, who wants to sit and watch TV when you're literally like people like try to mm -hmm. get time off just to go to places like this. And this is, you know, yeah. where you would live. And, and so you're over there and you discover like, okay, there's a lot of people like me here. I feel like in one sense I fit in, but maybe yeah. in another sense, you're like, I kind of, I kind of don't because this yeah. isn't where I grew up. Absolutely. I mean, you walk into a store and immediately the store owner pegs you as a tourist and they're going to charge you tourist rate. And even yeah. if you're wearing <laughs> local clothes, they peg you as, okay, that guy's a tourist. And the first thing they'll say is, um, where, where did you come from? And, oh, I just came from my uncle's house. Or, sorry, I just say I came from the uh, Sugar Corporation headquarters. No, no, no. What country are you from? And you're like, oh, they know that I'm not a local. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, no matter how hard you try, but yeah. you know that's that's part of it is the fact that and and one of the things that I think I realized when I did go to India is the difference between a tourist and a traveler. Yeah, yeah. A tourist just wants to see but not experience. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My wife is a tourist. I'm a traveler. No, no. I want to actually get to the places. Uh, for example, one of the trips I took without my wife. I wound up sleeping on the Great Wall of China overnight, four hours outside of Beijing in, uh, <laughs> in tents. She would yeah. never do that because unless there's a plug and PowerPoint, I'm not going to do that. Um, right, right, right. But I find that I need to be a traveler and experience and learn from people, listen to what people have to say and, and enjoy yeah, the yeah. culture and the food. Which, which I love that because my wife and I have been both because um, we spent three years on we, uh, on a world tour. Not that we're famous, but I mean, mm -hmm. just kind of going and living in foreign countries. And nice. what a what a difference it is versus like, say, going to Paris to see the Eiffel Tower versus mm -hmm. like staying with locals somewhere in France or, oh, totally. you know, living in Guadalajara in Mexico instead of in Cancun or Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. Where you know we live in the hacienda with cockroaches and bed bugs, and you know go to the local store where everything's chilly and lime, and and everyone looks at you like you have two heads because they're like, yeah, what are, what are these people? What are these gringos yeah. doing here? And then we'd have to say, no, we're not gringos. We're actually Canadian and Australian. <laughs> yeah, and they love us. Uh, yeah. it, it, also, it was I went to the Middle East for the first time uh, for yeah. work, but I went to the Middle East for the first time and. It was interesting because people said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're going to that part of the world. It's so dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I landed my first my first experience was I landed in Kuwait and Kuwait yep. is right next to Iraq. And Iraq was going through major upheaval at that time. And people said, you're crazy. And then yep. I went to other parts of the Middle East as well. And when I came back, people were like, oh, so what was it like? How dangerous was it? And I said, it's extremely dangerous. And they're like, really, what did you experience? I said, well, I tried to cross the road and it was so hard. And they were like, <laughs> yeah. what about the, you know, what about yeah, kidnappings? Yeah. What about all the gun shooting and all of that? And I'm like, it's actually safer for me to walk around the streets of Bahrain than it is for me to walk around in some of the streets here in Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. So, no kidding. Take a walk down East Hastings street in the middle of the night and see how it goes for you. Totally. Yeah. But that's where I think people need to experience and travel. And, you know, and obviously you don't want to walk around with hundred dollar bills hanging out of your pocket. Sure. Uh, sure. Just inviting people to. Yeah. Totally. But equally <laughs> we felt so safe. Just, I felt so safe walking around uh, midnight at those parts of the world. Uh, and, and I think the more we travel, the more, and I love what you said, John, about, you know, staying at people's houses or experiencing their hospitality. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh. The most dangerous thing I did encounter was in the Middle East. And that was when I was invited to a Bahraini mother's house for lunch. And the, she wanted to feed me and she just wouldn't stop. Yeah. And that's, that's the dangerous part is the hospitality. Yeah. You know, my brother lives in, in Turkey and Turkey is yeah. kind of straddles between the Middle East yeah. and Europe. And it's, it's a bit of a blend and, and sort of a, and, uh, once they stop seeing you as a source of tourist dollars, yep. it's so incredible. They're so love their culture and want to share it with you. And when you show appreciation yep. for the culture, man, it's just amazing. So yep. like in Canada, we're such a young culture mm. that, and, and I think Canadians in general are pretty hospitable. We, we, we got our warts and things like that <laughs> as a country we're, we're far from perfect. Yep. Um, but, but we're such a young culture that we don't have the same sort of deep rooted, strong cultural identity. You mm -hmm. know, uh, as you go to some of these countries that have been around for, I don't know, 
thousands upon thousands of years. And when you embrace yeah. their culture and appreciate it, because, you yeah. know, the Western world is obviously uh, like the most, some of the most advanced and developed countries in the world. And so we're seen in a certain light. And then you go there and you yeah. show an appreciation for what they have. Like, it's, yeah. it's amazing, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, e even in Mexico, um, you know, when, when we started hanging out with the locals, because we're just living in a, living in, in, in a hacienda and, and whatnot, like, they kind of, it was kind of interesting. Like they kind of never forgot that we were white, but they, they didn't really treat us all that different because we figured out how to speak, you know, a functional version yeah. of Spanish. And, yeah. uh, <clears throat> you know, it was, they were so incredibly hospitable. So, um, but from Fiji, did you go from Fiji to India or did mm -hmm. you come from Fiji back to Canada and then take a trip to India? Oh, so I did uh, multiple trips to Fiji and it was only yeah. later that I suddenly then thought, oh man, I've got to do this trip to India uh, to, to seek out and find my ancestral roots. I mean, the mm. thing was that my grandfather left India in 1905 and uh, hopped on a steamer ship and uh, the boat was on its way to Argentina and he wound up in Fiji. And <laughs> okay. it's, it's, there's one of three stories that, um, and again, uh, the information you start losing, if anyone's ever interested in trying to find uh their ancestral roots and things start early because the, the older people become, the more the memory goes. And yeah, um, yeah. when I was asking people, I said, well, how did my grandfather wind up in Fiji? They said, well, he was on his way to Argentina. Cattle ranching is what he had heard about. Um, and there's one of three ways that he wound up in Fiji. Number one, you're coming from a landlocked part of India and you're traveling by boat. Maybe he just had enough of sea travel and said that's right it. i'm, I'm getting off this darn boat yeah getting off. one number two maybe the boat landed in fiji and it was just this beautiful paradise and he said you know i think this is the place i'd like to settle because it's so beautiful <laughs> yeah or number three maybe he got off the boat thinking this is argentina the boat left and he's like <laughs> wait this isn't argentina <laughs> yeah Oh, and you know, when your grandpa landed in, in uh, Fiji, did he speak English at all? No, no. He only spoke uh, Punjabi and Hindi, and mm -hmm. his English would have been very rudimentary. Uh, but then right. uh, my father and the main language in Fiji is English. So I right, guess yeah. through the conversation later on, he may have picked up more of the English. But yeah. uh, that's, that's how we think he wound up in one of those three ways. That, that's funny. I mean, and it really is interesting to figure out, like, um, you know, a, a friend of ours, he was, I uh, wanted to get on a, a boat to Canada. He was, he was fleeing uh, Macedonia under communist times and he ended up in New Zealand. Um, and I think that the difference was uh, how they express yes and no is, mm -hmm. is the opposite of how we do it. And so it was like, do you want to go to New Zealand? And he nodded his head and they said, uh, they took that as a yes, even though he was trying to communicate no, he wanted to go to Canada. And uh, so he, he wound up in, in New Zealand. <laughs> and end up working on a railway and didn't speak a word of English over there either. So, uh, right. but I think that doesn't make things interesting. Now, when I, I would, I've never traveled to India. I've been to 45 countries, but I've never been to India. Mm -hmm. It is on my list. I would love to go there, but it does feel like an intimidating place because it's, yeah. it's a cultural hub like of the world in a sense, like historically speaking, it's also this immensely diverse country with, I don't know, thousands yeah. of dialects and how many yeah. different ethnic groups and, yeah. um, and, and just an overwhelming like volume of people. And I think, boy, I stand out like have a neon light on my head shining like, hey, I'm a tourist. Please take advantage of me in every way possible. You know, um, yeah. how did you feel uh, going over to India? Yeah. And it was I think to your point, it's it's absolutely correct. Like, I don't care what anyone tells you. You will never be prepared for what you are going to experience when you get to India. I mean, again, I've traveled to numerous places. And, you know, if you've been to Egypt and you've seen the traffic if you've been to yeah. Thailand and seen the traffic multiply that by 10 and then that's India um, and I yeah. just remember when I landed in India you know everything behind the exit out was very familiar to me I mean you get off the plane you go to the immigration slash customs collect your bags etc uh, but as I got closer to that door when you exit and now you're in India the door opened and there was all of this noise and people. And I remember my wife and I stood on the door. It literally felt like the door kept hitting us and opening and opening. And we stood there. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I felt like Moses in the Red Sea because there was um, a partition on like a, a guardrail on either side. And there was literally 
about a thousand people. That's what it felt like, mm -hmm. you know, to both sides of us screaming at us to say, you know, here, we can give you a ride and this and this and that. And I told my wife, I said, you look to your left. I'm going to look to my right. We have to find our driver. And I just remember, you know, as we're slowly walking and everybody's just trying to reach out and to get us to be drive uh, to drive us. I right. suddenly in the distance saw the name. It wasn't spelled correctly. I said, I don't care. I'm going with him. And that's right. Where yeah. Yeah. Our trip started. And uh, it, it, it really is an eye opening experience. But uh, I think, you know, if anybody has ever watched Monty Python, it's the best mm. way I could describe it. You either really love Monty Python or you really hate it. There's nothing in between. You're yeah. either going to really love India or you're going to hate it. But I think if you go in with an open mind, you're going to love it. You're going to yeah. love it. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, like I, I have uh, friends of Indian heritage and even some who've, who've come over from India. And of course, they always say, if, if you're going that way, let me know because I'll connect you to some people and whatnot. And I think that yeah. that would make me feel a little bit more at ease. <laughs> Uh, uh, just if you can get one person who's a local, who's got your back mm -hmm. a little bit, we you know, okay, like someone's going to look out for me. Cause I'm like a sitting duck here, yeah. overwhelmed by the volume, the noise, the the yeah. culture, the language, like, and my wife and I are like, we're experienced travelers, I would say. Yep. Um, you know, I remember getting off the plane in Manila. That sounds like a bit like Manila. Yeah. Manila is a city of like 20 plus million people. So like two thirds, like this population of Australia jammed into a city. Oh Yeah. And, and it is just, there is no organizational structure whatsoever. It is sheer madness. It is like an assault on all of your senses. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was quite an experience. But, you know, again, once we got out of like the, the big city and into sort of some of the more rural areas, it was like, okay, now I feel like I can breathe again. You know, like obviously yeah. we stick out like a sore thumb, yeah. but yeah, the big cities are just like overwhelming. Totally. So how, how did you, uh, and, and did you have family over there that you were meeting or connecting yeah. with at all? Or just, nope. no, we're just going to a hotel. And did you yep. fly to Delhi or where did you fly to? We flew into Delhi. And the way I best describe it is I am a foreigner going to a land that should not be foreign to me in search of a needle in a haystack and not knowing where the haystack even was. Like that's where right. I wanted to go find my grandfather's house. And all I had was very little information all i had was this faded photograph which is about three and a half by three and a half dingy yeah. uh which my cousin had given me because my dad's older brother had gone to india so i had this photograph and very little information to go by we knew that the name of the village is chadori uh it sits about six miles from the town of garshankar in the district of hushyarpur so that's all i had to go by right but the challenge john is the people who are from India, and I'd ask, and they said, well, I know Hushyarpur, never heard of Chadori. I know Garshaka, never heard of Chadori. Right. Uh, I guess day before I left, my step-cousin in Fiji said, look, I went to India, made it to Garshaka. The name of the village is actually Janodi, not Chadori. So I thought, okay, Janodi. Well, I found a place called Jandoli, but no Janodi. So Jandoli, Chadori, five miles, six miles from Garshankar. I thought, okay, this has to be it. And uh, so that became part of that journey to go find it. Uh, but it was also about identity. Like, you know, that Indian identity, I had been sort of in the background, never really uh, embraced it. I think the, the pinnacle moment on that trip for me was, Prior to India and in the beginning of traveling in India, my life was what I would call a tali. In other words, a tali is an Indian platter with segmented dishes. So I'm British, Canadian, Indian, and Fijian, and they're unique right, and right. distinct. And yeah, the Irish chutney's in there as well because of the Irish military pipe band. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm all of these segments. But the epiphany I had, I remember I woke up at 4 a.m. after probably about 10 days in India. And I just remember abruptly waking. And I was like, wait, I'm doing this all wrong. <clears throat> I was looking at my life as, as a Tali segmented. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But instead, I said, my life is actually what we would call Kichri. Kichri is a rice dish, uh, an Indian rice dish, that basically you go to your fridge, you pull out the vegetables, you have the rice, you add your spices and flavoring to it. And it's a blend of flavors. And I think that's mm. the best way for me to describe myself is that the realization I had is that I'm a blend of these cultural identities and that I don't need to have it distinct. So that's, right. I think, the identity piece that I was able to realize by going on this journey. But I had to have my mind open to all of this at the same time. 
And did you end up making more than one trip over to India? So I've made two trips. One was this trip, and then the other one was actually a work trip. Uh, but definitely would love to go back. I mean, and, and I think there are plans on uh, going back to India, you know, to, to explore even further. Right. Did, did the second trip back feel a little bit less intimidating? It, it definitely felt less intimidating. Part of it because I had experienced India, uh, but equally at the same time, being a work trip, everything was all scheduled and planned as opposed to us planning everything. Uh, so it was a little bit easier the second time around. And I know that the third time around would be even easier. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in going on this this kind of journey of discovery and trying to figure yourself out, <clears throat> pardon me, what, what were you hoping to discover in a sense? Because it seems, it, from, if I am understanding correctly, there was like this sort of pull on the inside where you felt like I'm not entirely complete as a person because there's a part of my heritage I don't fully understand. Right. And did it, and did going, I guess, did going on this voyage kind of satisfy that, so to speak, or did it open up more doors and more questions? You know, I, I think it actually satisfied it because it, it helped me to realize I went to India to look for my Indian identity, but the realization was I was always Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, and it always comes back to living in Canada. People, you know, I mean, visibly, I look Indian, but mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. and they come up to me and say, what part of India are you from? And I'm like, well, you know, I was born in England, raised in Canada. No, no, no. Your parents, what part of India? My parents are from Fiji Islands near Australia. <laughs> okay. and they're like, are you Indian? And it's like, well, my grandfathers are from India. Right. And, but then equally people are like, well, you're not Indian, you're Canadian. And, so it was always this challenge of, you know, allowing people to start labeling. But instead, what I was able to do on this trip was to stake a claim to say, I'm Kichari, I'm a blend of these cultures and uh, flavors. And as a result, I'm going to embrace them all. I don't need <laughs> yeah. to I don't need to justify which one I am uh, at yeah. whatever point in life. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really powerful statement to make. I don't need to justify, almost like I don't need to justify what I am. I just am yeah. what I am because at the core, like all of us are, are, are human. Yeah. Um, and, and so you've written a book about this journey and you dive into quite a bit more detail about this kind of this journey of individual discovery that you went on. Yeah. Um, what, what, what's the name of the book? So the book is called Lost and Found, Seeking yep. the Past and Finding Myself. And I yeah. think the essence of the lost and found, the village was lost, my identity was lost, it was found seeking the past and finding myself because, uh, you know, there was a lot of noise. People said, you can't find it. You don't have enough mm. information. Uh, why are you even looking for the ancestral roots? Uh, you know, when you find your village, if you ever find your village, you may not even get a good reception. So there was always this noise, but I wound up going further ahead and saying, nope, I'm going to do this. And I guess the best way is, uh, for me to describe it is we wound up finding this village of Jandoli. Mm. We wound up finding this courtyard. And, uh, you know, here I am walking around with this photograph going, are you part of my family? And uh, <laughs> yeah, they looked at this photograph and uh, the village elder, he came and he said, well, I don't know, but I think, the, you know, we'll see. Uh, so he said, I think I know this person that's in the background. And I said, okay. So we wound up going to a house there. And yeah. then I was writing in my journal with all this anticipation until I saw the person go like, no. And I was like, okay. But he said, wait, but I think the house is further up the road this way. So it, in Jandoli, what happened is we met all these beautiful people. They wanted to really help us. We went to five different houses. Uh, Jandoli, beautiful village, beautiful, beautiful people, but wrong village. And I remember one thing they said when we came back to the original courtyard they said, you weren't able to find your village, but you know what? Why don't you come back tomorrow and just be part of our family? And I thought, wow, what a, what wow. a great statement. Yeah. Um, and then, but I, I didn't want to give up. So I went back to the hotel, phoned my parents, and I told my dad, I said, look, I tried. It just didn't work out. And his thing was, you know what? Just enjoy India. Don't worry about it. And my wife thought we were going shopping the next day. I said, no. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, I told my driver when he showed up, I said, uh, forget what everyone has said. Let's just drive to Garshankar and start talking to people. So we drove to Garshankar. And it was interesting because, yeah, it was the same thing. I've never heard of it. Uh, Note, uh, you know, if you find it, it's you're not going to get a good reception, etc. 
But this one gentleman said, wait, did you say Chadoti? And we said, yeah, Chadoti. And uh, again, carrying this photograph, he said, Chadoti, my understanding, he said, it's, I think it's up the road this way. At this point, John, there's a lot of, I guess you could say, reservation on my side to say, mm, okay, I don't even know if this is it. But anyways, here we go. So we drive up the road five, six miles, and we come up to this archway. And there's an old man seated there. He's looking at the ground. And, you know, we interrupt his day. It wasn't busy because he was just looking at the ground. And we show him the photograph. And he looks at it. He goes, well, I don't know about the house, but the guy in the back looks like so-and-so. And I'm like, you're like 80 years old, no glasses. And I can't even make out these people. Yeah. But he said, okay. And he grabs the picture, gets into our vehicle. We drive to a house. He walks up. Uh, the driveway and all these people come out mm. and then he's got the picture and he goes up and he starts talking to people and I can see the people looking and uh, sort of gawking at us. Okay. Who are these people? So he shows them this picture and this one woman with a white shawl, she yeah. looks at this picture and she goes, that's me in the picture. Who are you? So it's like, are you kidding? And I had to sort of do a double take. I said, <laughs> wait, did I hear you correct? This is you in the picture. And she said, yeah, that's me in the picture, but who are you? So I had to explain who I was. And what I found was my grandfather's house. And the people that I reconnected with was my grandfather's older brother's family that we had been separated for probably about three generations now. So, wow. yeah, that's, that's what the journey was. <clears throat> and uh, that's why I thought it was such an important uh piece to to write about it's a story about recover about rediscovery yeah that's amazing and and so when you made this connection you know were you received as family into like this house like you know yeah. actually the i and i wrote about it in the book it it, it really hit me like a ton of bricks because she said you know what you're home and all of a sudden it just was like this wow and Part of it is I went out into the fields and I scooped up some dirt from our village and I brought it home to family who I know will never go there. But uh, her words, your home, just really rung true to me. And uh, it just it just made all the difference to say your home. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's remarkable. Well, Sam, it's quite quite a story and it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And I think I think people would really get true, true joy mm -hmm. out of out of reading it and you know, if, if people were to take mm -hmm. one one nugget away from this conversation, what would you like them to, to take from our chat today? Yeah, the main thing I would say is, you know, I was able to actually find my grandfather's house. But I often have conversations with people who say, well, that's great, but we have no connection back or we have no idea where our ancestral roots. We have an idea, but, you know, like I for example, was talking to a gentleman from, from Italy or his background, he's Canadian uh, or American, and he said, my ancestral roots go back to Sicily, but, you know, we have no records whatsoever. And he felt like he was also lost. And I said, but here's the thing. Did you go to Sicily? And he said, no, no, I've been to Sicily. And I said, yeah, but when you went to Sicily, did you feel a connection to this place? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, you did exactly the same thing I did. I just went in a different direction. But if you felt a connection to a place, then that is equally home to you. So mm. I think from a standpoint of that, whatever your, your roots are or whatever, just go there with an open mind and realize that if you feel that connection, it's, it's like you've, you've found the place. Added to this, do it sooner as opposed to later. And yeah. the reason being is I think it's really important with regards to discovering the identity and go with an open mind. And John, I'll just leave you with this small quote that I have in my book. It says, travel isn't always pretty. It isn't always comfortable. Sometimes it hurts. It even breaks your heart. But that's okay. The journey changes you. It should change you. It leaves marks on your memory, on your consciousness, on your heart, and on your body. You take something with you. Hopefully you leave something good behind. And that was by Anthony Bourdain. And it just was a quote that just resonated with me mm -hmm. on the essence of this, but what it means to be that traveler. 
I love that. Sam, thank you so much for taking time today. It's been it's been a great conversation and I look forward to getting to read that story myself. Ah, and it may be now working on a screenplay, so you may get to see it on the big screen. That would be a pleasure. Thank you again. Appreciate it. See you, John. Thank you so much for tuning in to Between the Before and After. If you've enjoyed this episode, please like, share, subscribe, or leave a review because that helps this podcast to reach and inspire more people. I love exploring the stories that take place between the before and after, the powerful experiences that shape who we become, and I love human potential. I love the possibilities that lie within us. So whatever you may be up against, I hope these stories inspire you because if you're still here, your story's not done yet, so keep moving forward. Anyone can come from any place of brokenness and destitution and build an amazing life.